I'm Avery Bang, and I'm the president and CEO of Bridges Prosperity. So we're really, really focused on the rural contexts of developing frontier markets and how can you build physical infrastructure to connect dislocated populations. So very, more specifically, we build bridges, but the literal kind. I think a lot of times in social impact, you hear people, we're bridge builders. Um, we are actual bridge builders. Um, we've now built, I think, 334 bridges, and we have 1.1 million people uh, around the world across 22 different countries currently crossing our bridges. The whole story started when you were a student, an engineering student, and you went to Peru and you said, I need to build a bridge here. I need to help. Can you tell us a little bit more? Well, Darius, I'll actually back us up a bit. Um, I was, in fact, living in Fiji when I was, uh, I turned 21 in Fiji. So I had, a, you know, a bit of a, like, how could I find a way to create social impact in my future career? And, um, you know, I kind of imagined maybe healthcare would be a good, good way to be able to help people and serve humanity. And so I was volunteering with a local chapter of the Breast Cancer Foundation. And you know, my task, it was essentially to hold the little leaflets and to walk around and help the, the members that were really more sophisticated how to teach women in rural communities the importance of early breast, uh, breast cancer detection. Just really simple, you know, self breast exams and things. But the challenge was in the morning you'd leave and you'd go out to, you know, down the bus and down the dirt road and you'd eventually get to a river. Mm. And so our ability to get to these rural populations was a total unknown. Could we get there, could we not, was entirely predicated on the height of that river that day. And frankly, are we brave enough to go across, I don't know, knee or waist height water right now? Right. If in two or three hours when we come back, you don't know how high it would be. And, and you know, I'm, not, I'm not that clever. I didn't have a solution. I just had a, a real felt sense of the problem. And a few months into this volunteer opportunity, we came across the pedestrian bridge. And it was just like that moment where you're like, oh, that's not that hard. You know, we, here we go across this little cable, Indiana Jones <laughs> pedestrian bridge of sorts. And we were able to easily get to these women to teach them the importance of, um, you know, our mission. But then that same bridge was allowing kids to come back and go to school, farmers taking their production and produce to markets. And it kind of occurred to me as um, something of an equalizer. You know, if you're born on the yeah. wrong side of the tracks yeah. or the wrong side of the river in this yes. case, your access to health, education, commercial opportunity was severely stunted. And so I actually went on to, you know, any good millennial, <laughs> I went on to Google and I'm like, who builds pedestrian bridges in low income countries? And there's like only two Google hits at this time. This was back in uh, 2005. And there is a very established, amazing organization called Helvetas, which I actually sit on the board of directors here in the United States for now, mm -hmm. many years later. And, and they've built thousands of these bridges in Nepal. And then there's this tiny website called Bridges to Prosperity. And it's mm -hmm. um, our founder, Ken France, had built an AOL scrolling website with his photo and his personal cell phone. Mm -hmm. And... I thought maybe at age 20, I'm more, you know, this guy might answer my phone call. These three people certainly would not. So I ended up, you know, picking up the call phone and, you know, dial up his number and said, Hey, my name is Avery. Um, I'm on a sabbatical for my engineering undergraduate, but I'd really like to build a bridge with you and with Bridges to Prosperity. And, you know, the, the long, the short of it are, it took many phone calls a lot of persistence, but he eventually acquiesced to my, my kind of stubborn uh, you know, persistence. And he allowed mm -hmm. me to um, work with a group of students to build my first bridge in Peru back in uh, 2005, 2006. Start with the most complex uh, people management and people leadership. You know, ability to attract and retain smart people and, and to be able to let them grow and be beyond you is important. Um, the second thing that I, I think is often lacking in the social sector is a financial literacy and business acumen. 
going to business school, I think, built my vocabulary. Um, and certainly it built a lot of my, um, you know, my sense of confidence that I actually do have a, a deep sense of, you know, what is the most effective and efficient way mm-hmm. for infrastructure to get invested in? How can you think about the different buckets of capital that might be there? How can you get different players to come to the table together that might not otherwise uh, understand the value proposition? Um, and, and also be able to, you know, get debt, you know, get, get equity positions, get, figure out, get philanthropy to be able to be more leveraged by taking a first loss position, figure out how governments can come into the table uh, and, and be able to get their money to work to do more. Um, and so I think business acumen or financial literacy, one of the same, um, is really deeply important. And I, I think the third is a little more esoteric. So you can cut this out if you don't like it. Okay, yeah. But I think of a, <laughs> I think a discipline to manage to out to outcomes or metrics is a third part that I really have learned and leaned into. So for example, in early days of Bridges to Prosperity, we thought monitoring and evaluation was really the only place where you needed to have really good tracking on, you know, whatever you care about, you're trying to track that and be able to, to enumerate that. But as we've moved on and evolved, you start to realize that almost anything you care about, if you do care about it, you should be able to measure. So how can you set up goals and, you know, we burn in objectives and key results. So it's called OKRs. And we, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of more of a Silicon Valley, uh, Google product, but mm-hmm. OKRs, like what are the objectives that we could actually make measured um, progress against? What are the key results that we want to target? And that's in addition to like how many bridges or how many people or, some of the more traditional key performance indicators. It's more on the strategy side. So being able to, you know, not only structure your organization to be data driven, but to be disciplined enough to make decisions around that evidence base. So I think what did I learn was your question. It's, it's a commitment to say, I am committed to the outcome, not the input. I'm not here to build you a bridge. I'm here to provide safe access. And so the moral kind of ethical orientation around that meant that at the time when that first bridge got ripped out, we had already made a commitment to that community and those communities and those 10,000 people. But if we were not able to actually serve that community, we had to go build those skills, find the resources and come back. But we were committed to do that as the principle of the matter. We're here to provide safe access. And if we can't do that, we're gonna make sure we have the technology to do so. Have you developed your own methodology for measuring impact or do you outsource this? I'll give you a macro, then I'll get to the specifics. Those are the things that like, how many bridges, how many people, um, we have some catchment stuff, which I can talk about. The more medium to long-term, which might be outcomes, you need to say impacts, mm-hmm. those are actually very difficult, if not unethical, to try to capture with attribution as an entity. So we outsource those. So just to right. be more explicit, um, you're thinking about, well, how many people am I going to serve? That is something that I can put little data counters essentially on a bridge and you can get mm-hmm. a uh, binary like how, you know, ones and zeros send in a text mm-hmm. message to me at any hour of the day, how many people have crossed this bridge in the last hour? That's something I can do internally and I right. feel that's good, robust data. How much money is now in the hands of that farmer because he crosses the bridge? That requires essentially attribution and you have to be able to control. So just like if you were to do a medical study, we found in a four year longitudinal study in Nicaragua, with bridges, huge gains around labor market income, which makes sense, you go to get more yeah. jobs, but more surprisingly, farmer profitability. Like let's say you and I are starting a business and we're trying to help a farmer. If you could raise their profits by 75%, that's in our development space quite, quite impressive. But the difference with a bridge, it's not just one farmer. In the Rwandan context, we have an average of 2,500 people that get served by one bridge in the immediate oh confinements so the kind of if you start to think about does it make sense to pay for a bridge how long does it take to generate enough revenues to substantiate that investment these bridges pay for themselves in the first two years in terms of what happens in terms of new farmer profitability locally huh. which is cool what are your plans and how do you imagine how would you like to bring it you know to the next level be honest mm-hmm. um we've been in the last three years that we've given serious thought to how do we move from being the world's best and most um 
known organization for rural transport with bridges into making this something that everyone adopts and we actually start to solve the global problem. And we think a lot about this probably more than mm -hmm. anything else we do. And so our current plans are, as I mentioned about Rwanda, we first felt like it was important to prove not only bridge by bridge by bridge, district by district, but how can you actually solve a problem at an entire national level? And there's some key things for us that we thought that was important as it relates to systems change. One, you start to build a portfolio big enough that the national government can sign a check. So you had to make a pool big enough to prove that it could happen on a national level. That's our theory, our organizational theory of change right. is that, you know, once you can prove this can be done at scale in a volume contract and you can second part of it is demonstrate the efficacy of that investment. So how much economic rate of return do you get for this investment? We then believe that governments could and should procure this work without us. So how do you do that? is a systems change quagmire. So we are currently trying to build a global coalition, um, which there's already many, many gatherings of people, organizations, very, very smart folks thinking about transportation in developing countries and in general. And there's a lot of very, very smart people putting a ton of money into road last mile access. But what we're trying to add to the table is, hey guys, one billion people, one in seven people in the world walk everywhere they go. And someday they might get a bicycle. And someday, 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 someone's gonna come in with a moto. So if we spend all of our money and attention just putting vehicular infrastructure, we are missing the lowest hanging fruit and frankly, the highest economic rates of return that we can get. And so we're trying to build a coalition around last mile access. And um, our theory of change, which we haven't done yet, so track back mm -hmm. with me in a few years, is that we are able to say, look, the entire country of Rwanda is connected. It created this movement on the GDP. Here's what it costs to do. And we have a coalition, not only of other governments, of other really great NGOs, really other great funders who start to see that this is not only fantastic from an economic lens, but you now have improved outcomes around health, education, et cetera. So right. we don't think it's going to be us. We want to be more and more silent and more and more bolstering our partners, but it's hard to do. <laughs> Let's say we have social innovators that already have the idea, they have their prototype, they know it works. Now, how to go out there and try to attract uh, funding? So back in, 20, in 2005, um, we essentially made a list of all the companies that we could find. Some of them, what we called market aligned. So for us, people that were in engineering and construction or architecture, they seemed like they had already, a, they were predisposed to the thing we were trying to do. We, we considered them pre-qualified. They're more likely to like what we do. So you think about a healthcare initiative, you could go to you know, some of the, the private hospitals or you could think about other groups that do healthcare. You kind of start with a shared common language. And so we started talking about, well, within this corporate giving, why would they give to us? we are the next generation of engineers that will run their companies. They should give us money because we're going to come in and we're going to learn how to build bridges around the world. And we are then going to come back and be highly qualified engineers that could enter their marketplace. And so we sold that. So we had this whole thing of like going to companies, everyone we knew, um, we would like to have $2,500 from you. We'd like a thousand dollars. We had different categories and you'd be shocked. We raised $20,000 in like six months um, oh. with no fundraising experience and no credibility, frankly. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the donors for that very first bridge, he was at the time with um, president of this big engineering company called Black and Beach. And <laughs> I've reconnected with him and kept in contact and said thank you. And he continues to be a donor. But he was like, do you know, I actually use you, Avery, as an example in my sales training with my employees for a good decade. Do you know why? And I was like, I have no idea. He's like, you walked up to me after a talk and you said, you know, I'm not going to use his name, but, you know, sir, like, I, I'm impressed with what you do. Thank you for being an alumni of our great institution. I'm Avery. I'm building a bridge here. My teammates, we are doing it in Peru and we would like you to donate $1,000. 
And then he says, Oh, give me a call later. And you're like, no, I would. And I, what I, said, I was like, what you're saying. I was like, no, but I would like you to commit now because we are doing this this summer and we'd like to have the money. And so he used that as an example of for his salespeople of you sometimes just have to be shameless. And I see it as an opportunity to give him an ability to be part of something great. And I don't feel bad. I know he's not going to not feed his children or have a house over his head by giving us a donation, either through the company or individually. So I think gumption and for us, um, corporate was the good way to go. How do you identify key stakeholders that might be interested um, in your initiative? I saw that you gave a couple of TED talk speeches. Where else? What other outlets do you use to to bang around, hey, we're building bridges for poverty. Most everything we do is is in what we call inbound. Like I get a you know call from you. Like I don't I don't search this out. Um, we also got a phone call from the IMAX, and I came across your bio. So I ended up being an IMAX film, which was really an interesting experience. Uh, Ted, um, you know, they also found me. But I think that that's not very helpful for your for your audience. So I'll give some advice of how do you get to the place where people call you. I think in the early days, um, I would never say no to a speaking engagement. And I would actively put myself into a position of, I can be your lunchtime speaker. I can be your conference speaker. I can, and I was not very good. I think I was maybe a little shy. I'm trained as an engineer, so we're not exactly uh, taught to be great communicators in our curricula anyway. But just going to rotary clubs, going to lunch groups, going to small venues, um, that built my confidence. And public speaking is a great, um, it's considered marketing because a lot of times you're putting yourself out there to a big group of people. Only one has to stick or <laughs> none. Maybe they don't even have to donate right away, but eventually it converts. And I was very prolific in the again mainly injury and construction mainly I've, I've spoken in singapore i've spoken in australia i've spoken throughout europe in the united states but more developed world markets um where people of wealth and means aggregate right. for usually a technical reason so for me i'm very well known and if you can imagine this bridge engineers all know yes, us absolutely. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, but you kind of need to find a niche so i i mentor a number of different social entrepreneurs i had a good call a few weeks ago with the group of really bright uh, young architects in the UK. And, you know, my advice to them was, where is the AIA convention? How do you get part involved in that local chapter? Because if you can be the social impact wing of a group that's already established, everyone wants to do, not everyone, many people want to do well in the world. And you can actually ride on the coattails of this existing uh, association to get your name out there and to get yourself um, the experience and credibility. Over time, you can then say, is that a good use of my time and resource to do that, that speaking? Maybe it's too small. Maybe it's not the right audience. But I would really encourage your early stage social entrepreneurs to never say no, mm -hmm. if, you know, with resource allow, because it is really important to develop that skill and expertise of how to tell the story. Any words of encouragement, like a closing statement from you? The great challenges of the world will certainly not be solved because it's easy. I think they're not going to be solved by people that are going to be expecting something to be handed to them. I think they're going to be solved by, you know, innovators and, and wild enthusiasts and people that if you don't kind of think folks call you a little crazy, um, you're probably not going to be able to make it. So you know, being, uh, you know, you're not alone. There's a world of, of full of social entrepreneurs trying to do wild and crazy things. And, you know, there's a lot of, folks out there that want you to succeed, even though many people will tell you that you're barking up the wrong tree or it will never be done or it's not possible. Um, well, I assure you it is. So uh, best of luck. And I, I trust everyone will have quite the journey ahead.